afternoon, everybody. Is my microphone on? Is it too loud? No. Can you hear me at all? I'm projecting. Yes. Oh. Is this all right, I'll put it a bit closer. I'm the only one in the group who has to have notes with me, so I don't forget anything important. All right, how's this? The same? Yes. I'll just try and project to Beth. All right, so um, I'm going to round out the day with a little bit of overlap, but looking at some of the social impacts of climate change. A kilometer offshore in central Mozambique, three fishermen sit in a wooden uh, fishing canoe. Thunder cracks on the horizon and they turn and see a storm brewing. As they turn towards land, their sail snaps as wind catches their sail and the rope burns in their hands. As they approach the coast, Salt water and sweat stings their eyes and a fear begins to well up inside them as waves start to crash over their boat. In climate research, we record this kind of event as a number, say 19 millimeters of rain. And that dichotomy there is something that Mike Hume has called the paradox of climate change. So on the one hand, we've recognized humans as the central driver of climate change. But on the other, as we need data for quantitative metrics, we've increasingly removed it from the lived human experience. So my sort of meta-narrative for the talk today is that climate change, from a social point of view, is a really lived and felt and diverse experience that's mediated by culture and by context. So breaking that down and borrowing, um, borrowing uh, these from Ingrid, um, I'd like to start with what I'm going to conclude. So first, and Rashid touched on this nicely for us and set it out, the impacts of uh, climate change are distributed unevenly across different geographies. Going down a scale from there, the livelihoods of people who are already disadvantaged will be the most impacted. And third, some of the groups of disadvantaged people, subgroups within those, are going to be even more vulnerable. So just to sort of set the stage to tell you I'm not trying to be comprehensive, I'm trying to provide a few illustrative examples. There are a lot of different pathways, and, and the colleagues this morning and this afternoon have walked us through this. There are a lot of different pathways through which climate change impacts on these complex social ecological systems. This is just to highlight that climate change turns into many different climate hazards which impact both on the social and ecological components of our system and those feed through to have many impacts, a few of which I'm going to highlight this afternoon but um, by no means is this meant to be comprehensive. So the first of the three conclusions is that um, the geography is uneven and Rashid already set this up and, and did it for us. Essentially what this says is by 2060 catch levels are going to decrease significantly by 20 to 50 percent in a particular part of the world and that's that equatorial belt and where the tropical fisheries support the livelihoods of hundreds of millions of small-scale fishers and communities in particular. Um, I'm going to leave it there because I can go a little bit deeper in some of these. So not only are the um, catch declines going to be disproportionately borne by the tropics, um, bleaching is going to be disproportionately um, impactful in certain geographies and places around the world, particularly in the coastal tropics as well. So for example, coral reef bleaching um, is particularly uh, damaging in low-lying um, coastal communities. So for example, where I've done a lot of my research in the Solomon Islands, and particularly in one of the provinces called Malaita, there's a lagoon called the La, uh, Langa Langa Lagoon. And there's people there who have been displaced internally and they've built their entire communities on artificial islands made out of coral rubble. They're literally right at sea level and they're incredibly vulnerable um, to erosion, which is going to be one of the impacts of these bleaching and then coral die-off events. Another big and, and well-known one is obviously um, coral bleaching has really big consequences for the um, millions of small-scale fishers and communities that depend on them around the world. Um, these are sort of the more familiar examples, I think, for us of the impacts of bleaching. An interesting one for me is that 
The social impacts of, of coral reef loss and bleaching extend beyond the immediate um, user groups. So I was quite fortunate to be involved in a project um, that looked at 5,000 surveys of people um, who visited the Great Barrier Reef from all around the world. And what we were looking at is how different people value the reef. And we looked at three components of place um, attachment. So place identity, and we asked questions like, um, is the reef part of your identity? Uh, direct place dependence, so that's do you use the reef for recreational activities? And indirect place dependence, so do you value the kind of um, uh, services that the reef can provide, whether that be services like research opportunities or just biodiversity or the, the quality of life that it supports. And interestingly, but perhaps not surprisingly, what we found is that people from all over the world value the, um, the Great Barrier Reef. And that people across the world are feeling a real sense of loss um, while we're watching the Great Barrier Reef die, essentially. So moving on to another element of this une uneven um, geographical distribution, low-lying coastal countries are particularly vulnerable. And again, they're often distributed around that tropical equatorial belt. So this study came out two years ago, which actually quantified um, sea level rise in the Solomon Islands. So the, uh, the blue line here on the top is the extent of this island in 1947. And using satellite imagery, they documented the inundation and the loss of um, land in that particular island. And here is a man standing what used to be an island that his community was able to inhabit. And they've since had to relocate. So this study found um, five examples of islands that are, communities have actually had to leave already. And a friend of mine, um, Ruben, who has grown up in the Solomon Islands, he says that where his uh, traditional village lies, um, the place where they used to play soccer and the place where they would have their Christmas gatherings is underwater these days. And so if you think about a place that's special to you or a place that has value, I, when I think about mine, I've got a family cottage in northern um, Ontario in Canada and my sons are the fifth generation that will be part of that cottage and it's right now being threatened by these forest fires that are going through. And those are some of the social impacts that are hard to quantify, that feeling of loss for a special place or for a place that's part of our identity. So the second point is that livelihoods of people who are already disadvantaged are going to be impacted. And Rashid already made this point, but this is just to say that um, places that are vulnerable, so particularly Africa and, and Southeast Asia, going forward are going to become more food insecure. And if we move from this and focus in on oceans, um, we know that these are places where there's high food insecurity and there's a high dependence on fish for protein. So if you look at this graph, along the x-axis is total protein take. So you notice that the red and the blue bubbles, which are Asia and Africa, are low on the protein take um, side of things comparatively. And on the y-axis, we've got the share of fish as animal protein. So the countries down here are having lower protein intake and also um, have a high dependence on fish. Shall I just check the place? Yeah. Can we fix That's it? it? Yeah. Oh no, it got worse. There is other water. I think they are tight. I tightened it too much and it went pink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> disadvantaged populations are going to become further impacted um, is a way of saying that climate change doesn't occur in a vacuum. That's one of our favorite social science expressions. That means that climate change impacts are embedded in already complicated and complex contexts. So to illustrate, I'd like to walk through the case of Zalala Beach, which is where part of my PhD research was based. Oh, tough. <laughs> <laughs> Just to put it in context. Um, 
Here's Mozambique. It's about 30 million people. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. It ranks usually around 170 is out of 175 countries on the Human Development Index, something like that. Um, incredibly biodiverse. The reefs in the northern part of the country actually seed the reefs all along the East African coast. So very fascinating, very beautiful country, um, but has a really challenging history. So Mozambique was a Portuguese colony for more than 500 years. Um, when that wave of independence was sweeping across Africa, um, Mozambique had to fight for independence. It wasn't granted. It was a 10-year independence war, which was really destructive for the country. So as the Portuguese withdrew, um, infrastructure was destroyed purposely. So bridges and roads and records of companies um, was, was damaged in the process of withdrawal. That was followed in 1975 by a period of independence, um, and they became a socialist co country. Um, education and literacy improved and sort of um, some of those bas basic social structures started to rise but then it fell into that Cold War era and was part of um, what was a broader trend across the globe but there was a 17 year civil war in the country which only ended in the 90s. After the civil war um, free market poli policies came in and um, again complicated things for the local small scale fisheries sector so um, subsidy programs that they had had under the socialist government were removed. So this is all to say um, that the history of colonialism, war, and economic res um, restructuring has already put Mozambique's population at a disadvantage. And then if we go down to the local scale, all kinds of changes are happening as well. So for example, there's very few job opportunities in the country and fishing is a really good way to earn money. So migrant fishing crews from different parts of the country are moving um, and that creates all kinds of conflicts in the local context. Um, fishers who used to own their boats are now working as crew members. Lo lots of things are happening in that kind of context. Um, as well, the fishing techniques themselves are changing. So they're moving from these old traditional dugout canoes, which is on the right side, to these bigger um, launcher canoes, they call them, which can fit bigger crews. The nets are bigger. And as a result, um, the catch size and composition is changing. It's getting smaller. The valuable pelagic species are fished out. Um, so this is just to say that these changes are also um, disadvantaging these communities. And just to put this sort of in context, um, one of the things that we did was ask fishers over the last 12 months the kinds of stressors that they had been experiencing. And you read this list, it's everything. Um, catching less fish, experiencing severe storms, damage from these kinds of storms, death and disease is very rampant and very um, disruptive for a lot of these families. Lack of food, 60 out of 100 fishers that we talked to had experienced food insecurity. Um, so this is just to say that climate change is, is coming into this already complex um, and challenging environment. And one of the most um, tragic examples of the way these kinds of things can interact is in response to that declining catch in the inshore, um, these fishers are moving further offshore, but they're mostly in unmotorized canoes that are paddled or sailed. And when they go out, they're running into these storms which are bigger and more powerful than they've been used to, and they're drowning. So um, one of the communities I worked with, Salala Beach, has about a population of around 2,000. And while I was there, they lost a boat of 20 fishermen. So that's a massive uh, impact on the community. So, um, moving to the third point is that some of, yeah. Just had a question about Mozambique. Um, mm -hmm. The migrants, are they coming from agriculture? Um, because it, it seems strange that there's a lot of migrants coming in and food is becoming less secure. I'm wondering if there's some sort of welfare function. Mm -hmm. um, so, during the war, most of the fighting was inland, and so a lot of people fled from the fighting to the coast. So there was an influx of new okay. entrance to the fishery, but then overfishing is rampant along the coast, so people are moving generally um, south to find better fishing grounds. So where I was embedded in the central of the country, they were getting new fishing crews that had traditionally been in the north that are coming down to fish in the south. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add to that, um, that question that um, in Madagascar where we did a little bit of work, it's not only between fisheries people moving up and down the coast, but if there's a drought in the mountains and in the agricultural land, the people who are not fishermen traditionally move to the coast and compete with the traditional 
people on the coast. It's an enormous amount of conflict between the cultures, between the tribes, between... There, so, was, the, there was intermarriage troubles, yeah. there was all kinds. The, the, the wealthy crews from up north would arrive with their crews and their necks, and then they would hire the local fishers and all kinds of breakdown in the social, social structures. And, yeah. Um, okay, so the, the final point is that within these challenged contexts, there are subgroups that are even more um, disadvantaged and feel the impacts even more. So one of the things um, is obviously uh, climate change has got a real gender dimension. So just as some examples of what that looks like, um, in Bangladesh, women are largely responsible for the construction of housing platforms and ovens and garden plots. So after a relocation because of a climate event, um, the, the cost of rebuilding is largely borne by the women in the community. Um, we, women are often excluded from climate change adaptation discussions just by a measure of those social norms. And so often their priorities and their needs don't make it on the list. Um, another one which is relevant for us here is that women are often involved in the fishery in terms of gleaning and they work in that intertidal zone and that makes them very vulnerable to these um, climactic events such as tsunamis. There's a disproportionately hard, um, higher uh, level of women who get impacted by those kinds of events. Um, another group obviously is the extreme poor. So the poorest households are often um, the most vulnerable and the most impacted. So this is a very um, personal example, but in 2010, I got on a plane to go to Mozambique for several months of field work, and when I left, everything was fine. While I was in transit for you know 30 or 40 hours, um, the FAO cut its world forecast for wheat production because there was a drought in Russia, and so they announced it while I was in the air. And overnight, um, the price of bread jumped from four metakai per loaf to five metakai per loaf. And so for comparison's sake, that's about a jump from 11 to 13 cents US. So for us, it's quite small. But for the poorest um, people in Mozambique, that's a massive increase in price that they just can't bear. So they took to the streets and protested. And while I was flying in, it was right at dusk. And I could see these fires and tires burning in the city um, because people just can't cope. The poorest people can't cope with those kinds of increases. So is that kind of death, the same kind that the fishermen were reporting to you when you said that death and disease was one of their uh, well, in this uh, in this context, this was riots and police um, trying to cue the riots, and so these people were shot. In my community, it was largely um, disease related, so malaria, cholera, HIV were the big drivers of disease in the community where I was working. And the communities themselves were making the connection between these diseases and climate change? Or no, I was asking broadly. I didn't want to prioritize. I was just saying, what are the things that are making it challenging for you to get by? Um, so it, it wasn't in context. It was just in, in general. Yeah. Um, so building on this, I suppose, is that conflict element. Um, and this is something that many of the uh, of our lecturers have already referred to, but this is that kind of um, illustrative example of how climate change can actually exacerbate conflict, particularly around fisheries. So this is the new paper that just came out in Science, and it's the Fish Wars paper um, that Beth was referring to. That they they describe that macro war here. So a macro move from the UK to Iceland, and it caused conflict between relatively friendly and cooperative countries. Um, what they did here is they looked at the number of transboundary species by 2100. Um, and you'll notice that it's concentrated in areas such as Southeast Asia where the maritime relations are already strained. Um, so this speaks to the potential for climate change to exacerbate conflicts. Um, the last impact I'd like to touch on is uh, one that Rashid already brought up, which is migration. And this is a very specific example, but it's really illustrative of the lack of um, uh, thorough engagement with this topic. So the UK challenged their government to do this big um, overview of what potential adaptations for climate change might look like. They came up with this foresight paper, um, and one of the things that they highlight here is that migration can represent an adaptation to environmental climate change, which in many cases will be extremely effective um, way to build long-term resilience. And 
Um, Rashid called this ethically troubling. Um, I think this is at best a euphemism for something that's incredibly unfair. Um, but researchers are calling them out on this. So John Barnett and Saffron O'Neill um, have written this call on, under their maladaptation paper, which says there should be a legal responsibility for those of us who are part of these international rights um, conventions to um, take action to allow these people to stay and adapt in place and not try and spin migration as if it's a positive adaptation strategy. Um, so I'm trying to engage in those sort of issues around um, equity and justice in climate change adaptation research. There's a lot of language which is necessarily hopeful because it can be quite bleak and necessarily inspiring, but um, we have to proceed cautiously. And I've just published this paper called The Dark Side of Transformation, which urges us to use caution around language um, that might mask these issues of equity or might try and pitch climate responses as universally desirable. Um, so the Pacific Islands in particular have been really active at saying, we don't want to leave, we don't want to leave our islands, this is our place and our home and let's figure something else out. Um, and also this kind of language can sometimes mask the uneven distribution of benefits. So this presentation has, has highlighted that there are always uneven consequences, there's always um, winners and losers, and the losers are often the people who are already disadvantaged to begin with. So um, our colleague Nathan Bennett has just put out a bit of a research um, uh, call to action and it really outlines that these issues around equity and inclusion and social justice are really at the frontier of um, research around climate change adaptation. So just so that we're not all miserable and we can go to our <laughs> afternoon tea with a bit of a smile hopefully, um, I'd like to finish on a few um, I've called seeds of hope. Um, so that we're not too depressed. However, let me say the caveat, these are examples of grassroots innovations and they by no means um, preclude the need for reducing emissions. So it's obviously across that spectrum that, that Rashid pulled up. There's, action is necessary at many levels and individual action doesn't precede um, big negotiations. But let us, oh, first I'll summarize and then we'll go to see the point. So, I think I've made these points, but geographically, the impacts are uneven. Um, there are going to be more impacts in these places where disadvantaged people are living, and within those areas, disadvantaged people will be disproportionately worse off. So those are generally marginalized groups, such as women and elderly and children, um, indigenous people, and so on to see the hope. So this is very small scale, but it's really cool and inspiring and sometimes you need something to hold on to. So in British Columbia, um, First Nations uh, cultures hundreds of years ago practiced clan gardening. So essentially it's a form of, aqu of aquaculture or sea ranching where they build a sea wall out of stones and it holds the water longer and it flattens the slope of the beach and it really boosts the productivity of clams um, within those areas. So this was somehow lost and it's been revived in the last five or ten years along with <coughs> communities. And it's an incredibly inspiring way to um, deal with some of these impacts. So at, at the same time, it's boosting local food security by re, um, reviving these abilities to grow clams um, bigger and faster. It's also bringing back uh, local knowledge that was being lost. Um, and, and Potentially, I'm afraid to say this around you, Laurent, but there is ongoing research um, which is looking at, so part of the way they build these walls is by mixing in the old shells. So at a very small scale, localized level, they're doing research on whether that um, shell mixing can actually buffer some of the impacts of, climate, of uh, ocean acidification as well. So this is small scale, but it's an example of one of these sort of grassroots innovations. And the other one I'd just like to pitch up here quickly is, um, FADs, or fish aggregating devices. So many of you are probably familiar with these, but they're a very simple idea that can be quite effective. So essentially, if there's something floating in the ocean, pelagic fish um, aggregate underneath it. And you've probably seen it in the new Blue Planet series. They have a, a palm frond and a little um, turtle swimming underneath it. But it's very simple, and at a small community scale, communities can build rafts out of bamboo um, and anchor them offshore. And what it does is it draws pelagic fish in, such as tuna, that are normally not accessible to small-scale fishers, 
So it reduces fishing prefer pressures on reefs. And um, I forget who it was that highlighted reducing fisher pressure, fishing pressure alone is not enough to boost reef resilience to climate change, but it is a way to sort of lessen impacts. And it's also a really great way um, to it boost food security as well. So these communities that were reliant on a declining reef fish fishery are now accessing big pelagic fish as well. Um, so just to be true to the theme of this talk, which is that climate change impacts are very much socially mediated, the solution that works in one place doesn't always work in another place. These are very contextual examples, but um, there are really innovative, uh, exciting ways that people are responding to some of these, um, some of these social impacts. Thank you.